step into the ring. Hello everyone and welcome to the Missouri Scholastic Esports Federation Crew Battle Finals. And it looks like my camera's frozen right now, uh, but I am talking and my face is moving. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nuztech and this is Nine Whole Grains. And we're excited to watch some uh, some professional or some high level Smash Bros with you guys. How about you, Nine? Yeah, I'm really excited. Uh, at some point you have to teach me that technique, speaking without moving your mouth or your eyes <laughs> or anything really. Uh, I didn't know you could do that, but yeah, I really am excited. Uh, congratulations to the teams who've made it this far. Uh, I know that this was uh, a long and arduous process for these teams to make it through. Crew battles are a very, very draining format, uh, but it just goes to show uh, the talent that some of these players have. Yeah, definitely, for sure. This is the, the finals, so this is like, this is the big, the big final battle that uh, all these players have been waiting for and practicing up to this point. So we will see uh, these players who've been just doing extremely well bring out the Bring out all the styles, basically, and we'll see if any of them have been hiding any special tricks up their sleeves that we didn't get to see in the past games that they're finally deciding to just pull out when it uh, when it really counts. So uh, that'll be exciting. Uh, so let's let's do a quick uh, rundown of the the two teams that we're going to be um, playing against each other. Uh, I mean, obviously, you guys have probably seen them in past games because they had to win some sets to make it to this <laughs> final point. But we do have Holland North on one side, and we got CBC High School on the other side. And it looks like yeah. still not. 
Well, hey, no, that's all right. <laughs> yeah, you get to blink now, so that's the nice part. I have to stare at the camera and be stoic the entire time. But we do have the rosters for you all today as well. Those have been noted down here. We do have Yoshi Kid, Coco Master, Lucky, uh, Otter, and then Minted23 on Howl North. And then for CBC, we have uh, Kai, Luma, the Letter H, Time Master, and Prince. So those are going to be the five for each team competing for you today. Mm, yep, and a specific call out. I mean, obviously, all these players are great, but uh, I just want to give a special call out to Luma on CBC, who's uh, been quite the quite the talk lately in uh, in a lot of the, the Smash community for like SDL because he's a he's a player who's really been making a like making a good splash and picking out some good wins. He recently beat Driston at a tournament. Uh, he beat Yez as well. And if you're not familiar with either of those players, Driston is a high level Greninja player in St. Louis, and Yez is an Ike player from I don't remember which region he is, but. Yeah, that, I think like Chicago, Central like Missouri or I think I don't know. I think it's Central Missouri or somewhere in there. And also in my mind, they're both Ike players, so you know I'll just uh, <laughs> hold on to that one as long as I can. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, so so Luma is definitely uh, going to be quite a threat in this um, in these finals. Um, so it'll be I'll be curious to see what um, who's going to be able to, to to really match up to him on the other side over there. And now that I'm taking a look at the names, I'm, I'm recognizing some other people in Holland North too. Yoshi Kid. Uh, Otter, uh, yeah, we got some got some uh, names that I definitely see a lot in the the St. Louis scene uh, or the Missouri scene, web, rather. Yeah, and Otter you actually touched you, you touched on something there that I guess we can actually kind of talk about as we wait for the the first couple of players to ready up here. The idea of there being one extremely dominant player on one side, uh, you know, this is one of the few formats where you can actually almost plan your way around a really strong player. Now, mm -hmm. within reason, of course, you're not going to be able to plan your way around someone who's leaps and bounds ahead of your roster. But yeah. I, I think that that is one of the interesting parts. And I mean, I don't know. What's your take here? If you have a dominant player on one team, do you try to maybe put one of your not top five players on it if it's a matchup that you like? Or do you just try to throw your best player at their best player when they come up? Yeah, there's a lot of different angles you can you can approach it with, and I think all the ones you just mentioned are pretty valid. But in my opinion, I think I would definitely save like my best player for like um, for their best player, uh, just because like that's the point where you can really influence the tide of the of the crew battle. Um, another another method you could also do is just sitting out your best player first to just really raise your team's morale and like have them knock off a bunch of stocks. And not only is your team at that point having so much momentum that they're like, man, this is great. Like we're definitely gonna win this. But like the pressure is also just off of them at that point too. Like they can be like, okay, we're so far ahead that like it, it doesn't really matter uh, how, how poorly I do. Um, yeah, I, I agree entirely. And we, you actually talking about who the teams would send out first and that kind of strategy. We actually do know who the starters for each team are going to be. For Howell North, uh, let me get my sheet up here. For Howell North, we have Otter, who's gonna be bringing out a Terry here at the start. And on the other side, we have Kai coming in with the Cloud. So two blonde fighters here at the start, at least the characters. But you can see some pretty nice numbers on both ends. And Terry versus Cloud, I have to imagine, going to be a pretty explosive matchup. Yeah, what's also interesting is that Terry wasn't even one of the um, characters listed on uh, on um, Otter's uh, like his little player card thing. So he's, he's kind of pulling out a, um, a pocket pick, if you will, not even one of his, his mains for this for this first one. So I wonder if that's a, that could be a just like a, a counterfeit thing, or um, just could be could be a comfort. I guess we'll uh, we'll see how that turns out. Well, I think there are also some characters in the game that really benefit from this format. We were joking a little bit before about how Hero was more or less made for this format because, mm -hmm. you know, worst case scenario, you go in against their best player and you kamikaze and you take one of their stocks, and that's worth a lot more. Uh, Terry might be one of those characters as well. Very, very explosive. Of yeah. course, all the damage that he can pile up as quickly as he can, I think, really leads into it. So uh, mm -hmm. we are going to get started right now. The players have struck to Pokemon Stadium 2. Imagine that. We are going to get our <laughs> first match here of the 2021 SSBU Free Battles Championship. Reminds me of the good old days of offline Smash tournaments just saying to your opponent, hey, why don't you start PS2? Honestly, that's probably what they did. <laughs> all right, so we got uh, both. Characters kind of matching their outfits here. The one with the one with all black between Terry and uh, Cloud here. Let's see if he's going to be able to take the first stop. You see right there, both of these players with, or both of these characters rather, with very low commitment options that stack up 20 plus damage. Which uh, I think that makes the character all right. But 
Again, uh, to the other side, both of these characters can struggle a little bit off stage if they get in bad positions, and that's kind of another aspect of the crew battle. We talk so much about building up momentum and building up excitement. If you lose a stock early, you're not just letting yourself down, and as someone who's been in that position more than a few times, uh, it's gutting, I will say that. Yeah, definitely. Now, Cloud's got Terry off stage right now, and Terry is can be pretty linear with the way he gets back on stage sometimes. He can either come straight from below, uh, or usually, or sometimes he'll even go from, like, uh, sort of mid-level going with, like, a sideways, uh, like, a side B, I think it is. Um, Kai runs right up with the winning cross slash, and that's going to be the first kill. Kai having not taken too much damage so far, so he's probably feeling pretty good. Yeah, the uh, this part I think in the first game it has to be so scary to come out first for your team because it really does set the pace as you were saying. You see getting caught there, very nice job getting out there, cleaning it up very quickly. That was almost really bad. Falling through that with the air dodge there cleaned it all up, but I'm yeah, glad I to see you. With, with a little bit better DI, I think the uh, cloud probably could have lived there. But honestly, with how um, poor cloud recovery could be, you could probably just be like, okay, I'm dead either way. So let me just <laughs> head, head back onto the respawn platform and. Well, and that's the other th scary thing about Terry, is he can change up his timing ever so slightly so that you've landed now, and then he throws out his attack, and you've already changed your DI from where it was we were actually yeah, DIing exactly. before. Mm -hmm. Good patience from uh, Kai right there. He looks like he's, with his leaf he has, he's not really pressing it too hard. He's just kind of maintaining center stage and waiting for Yoshi to, uh, to go for something, or Otter. Can't tell who this actually is with the confusing name switch there. But, uh, yeah, so he's just kind of waiting for him to commit something really hard, like that. And unfortunately for Kai, not able to get a punish quite at that moment. But if uh, Otter keeps making these moves that leave himself vulnerable, then Kai's just going to keep taking stocks like that. Yeah, I mean, Cross Slash has been the name of the game right now. So much of the damage has come from that with just a little bit too committal of play from Otter here. And, you know, Terry's not a character I feel like that really needs to do anything too committal, right? Mm -hmm. Go for a jab, get some space in here. And I, it's just what the character is made to do. Precarious position does get back. Ooh. Oh, still scary. Okay, okay. Yep, double roll. I like that. <laughs> I'll take whatever damage I need to. Just get me away from the ledge. Yeah, honestly, I really like how well um, Kai is like maintaining stage control. Like he's got he's got a sword, so that's one thing that like Cloud can do really well with that massive range. Just dictate where um, Otter gets to go. And oh, that's gonna be unfortunately him falling down, only able to take one stock off of Kai. So Kai gonna be moving into the next phase of the crew battle with two whole stocks to deal with. Yeah, two whole stocks and pretty comfortable that entire game. Kai mm -hmm. playing exactly how you'd expect a Cloud to play against a brawler like Terry. Knock him away, charge a little limit, come back in, cross slash, go a grab, run away a little bit. But still early on, it's worth noting again for those of you just joining us, this is only 5v5. There are some longer formats uh, of this that can sometimes go 8v8. I've even seen a 10v10 crew battle, but in 5v5 makes it that much more important. So to already be at a two-stock deficit is going to hurt, especially when you know that their best player is still waiting in the wings. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think the second player that Howl North is going to be sending out is Coco Master, I believe. Um, yep, this is Coco Master. Oh, nice. Okay, so we've got a Nest player. For those of you who don't know me, I am also a Nest player, so I'm going to be very excited to see this Nest come through and do some cool things. But unfortunately, Nest versus Cloud is not a matchup that any Nest player has liked, even back in Smash 4. Uh, not really a fan of it, so <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll see how well Coco Master can uh, sort of play against the odds and, and, uh, and hopefully take some more stocks off of Kai. Yeah, and I mean, you can see the stat sheet here. Coco Master certainly on the stocks one number here, one of the highest in the entire tournament, second highest on the team, actually. And I think this moves to me says, OK, we've got to get that back. Like, we've got to bring this back together here. Maybe ideally you don't have to throw Coco Master out this early but uh, you have to now, being down two stocks already. I, I am a little curious though, Neztek, you mentioned that it's it's a rough matchup, and I actually, while I was doing some homework for this event, I saw Ziga actually mention that at a certain point in crew battles, matchups become negligible. So I'm curious, you, you know Ziga very well, what do you mm -hmm. think is meant by that? Is it just at a certain point when there's so few stocks to play with, you just gotta play against whoever? Yeah, it's weird because like, like on paper, normally, like when matchups are discussed, it's in the context of like three stocks versus three stocks. And sometimes that can really change if your opponent starts with one stock. So maybe you really, if you, if you already start the game with a stock lead, the matchup just becomes drastically different. So in a situation where maybe you need to press an advantage or try to look for openings, instead, because you're two stocks ahead, you just sit there and do nothing. Um, and, and that can be one of those things that, uh, that, that players have to think about when they adjust their, uh, adjust their mindset with, um, with matchups.
All right, I believe that we're already in. Yeah, we have town and city that these two are going to be playing to here. So, all right. For those of you unfamiliar with the crew battle format, you're going to see uh, something kind of fun here at the start. You'll see that Cloud currently sitting at three stocks. He's going to take care of that real quick. And now we're set. All right, so Kai picking off his uh, stock to get things back to how they were at the end of the last one. So already some good damage uh, <laughs> I was able to put on it. we got to get a name uh, change to do right here soon because that is uh, Coco. What's his name? Coco Master. Coco yep. Master. Yes. Yeah. So, uh -huh. uh, so already uh, Kai really makes good use of these uppies out of shield that Cloud players just know to use so well. Well, it's so scary, I think, for Ness players, too, because Ness is one of those characters that really likes to play around shields, and my goodness, 23% all that's taken here. Yep, and now the stocks are tied, so they are essentially an entire player behind the cadets right now, so uh, Coco Master really going to have to do something different here. One thing he's going to need to do is, with, with the way that uh, Kai is doing so much like up east like that, he's really leaving himself vulnerable, and if Coco Master can kind of bait that out, he can get a really decent punish. Oh, then unfortunately, he gets through not going to fight No, and now this is another really precarious position to be in. The empty hops from Cloud, so scary to get around. Now you're above. Oh, yep. the patience to not let any of the options on the limit break rip there puts it out. Yep, it's the stage control from that first game that we mentioned. Like, like Kai's just doing such a great job of saying, all right, like, I'm going to let you grab ledge and maybe get one inch back onto the stage, but you're not getting much further than that. And Ness is definitely a character who struggles under pressure. So uh, it's hard to imagine Hoko Master is going to find a way back to the stage at the point. <sighs> Tried and true, and at least a little <laughs> bit of footing here. You know, one thing that we've been saying this matchup is so rough for Ness, but at the same time, Ness is such an explosive character that can pile up the damage so quickly that, you know, he's one of the characters that can bring back a pretty decent stock deficit in this type of format, but, you know, like you said, so difficult. Hasn't been able to really, I guess, kind of decipher how Kai is getting out. It seems like it's a lot of up B out of shield, but it's Ooh. never quite that simple and a little too close there to the ledge. Yeah, and I can see why Coco Master thought that he would be get away with doing that because normally when he's off stage, Kai was just kind of like hanging more close to the middle and like that would give Ness some room to, to go for that. But at that moment, Kai was like, no, I'm going to stand right here in case you try an air dodge onto the stage. And instead, he gets even better by this. Yeah, and I think another thing, you were mentioning uh, the kind of like tricky potential Ness has to, to take a stock. One thing in this matchup that I think could really help him is being annoying uh, with Clouds off stage, whether it's PK Thunder, whether it's, it's like hanging yo yo. But what's crazy is Kai has not been off stage like at all. <laughs> so that weakness, that ex like moment of exploit for Ness has just been non existent. So now here, any good hit's gonna close this one out. A really rough spot to be for Coco Master. Yeah. Now you're finally gonna see some of that. But still oh. a little mistimed, and if he closes this out here, this is at least stopping the bleeding a little bit. But yeah, and also I feel like Coco Master did go with the least optimal uh, edge guard right there. He's really gonna have to like go to the edge and go for like a hanging yo-yo. That can be a back throw. Okay, oh, gets it anyway. Ooh. All right. Yeah, Coco Master, or uh, yeah, Coco Master able to turn it around right there and, uh, and and send Kai out of here. That's gonna be really good. The fact that he hung like hanged on there because. And then going to the next game, he's going to like have like a stock reset. Like he'll still be on his last stock. He goes all the way back down to 0%. So definitely a good position for him to be in right there. Yeah. And if nothing else to at least know that you could pull that out after such a disastrous start to that game, I think he had 60% damage on him in the first like seven or eight seconds there. So to mm -hmm. pull that back to what was basically even there, two stocks taken off by each. Uh, good stuff there to Coco Master, giving the team a fighting chance. Um. Okay, I'm noticing my camera's still not working. Still working on getting the new link for our uh, tech team here. But yeah, so another thing that I uh, another thing that was really cool um, that I saw the Nest player do uh, towards the end there is like obviously the back throw is a huge tool for Nest. So he he was really patient about how he um, like went for it towards the end. Like he got him in PK fire, and normally <laughs> a Nest player would like immediately be like, okay, he's stuck. Let me like grab him out of there and like back throw him. But he paid attention. He saw that uh, Kai was able to jump out of the PK fire. Uh, so we just like kept running and then was like, okay, well, let me just grab him once he lands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people start mashing buttons so quickly to try to get away. Eventually you do something like an air dodge, you accidentally hit the B button or the A button to throw out an aerial. And yeah, Ness uh, patient enough to wait. Been back thrown by a Ness yeah. a few, few too many times in that exact scenario. Uh, we do have the next player that's gonna be coming out here from CBC though. Uh, first of all, great stuff to Kai, taking five stocks there. 
Five mm-hmm. for three is a pretty decent trade, That's I would say. Yeah. Uh, also, but Prince... speaking of, yeah, speaking of patience, thanks for you guys for being patient. I now have my camera back, so you will see <laughs> in the face as we transition. But yes, we do have Prince uh, coming through here with a Joker. Okay. I feel like there's like a pun there somewhere. Isn't Joker like the prince of something? Like prince of thieves? Or I must be confusing it with something else. But either way, uh, Joker <laughs> should be a really good, uh, really good uh, change of pace to come in here. We very different um, play style than Cloud, so um, we get to see what uh, this player can do. Um, yeah. And I, I think even just looking at the very like the very surface level way to approach looking at a character like Joker in this is just think of how many R sends <laughs> Goko Master is going to have to get through in order to even the stock count again. Because that's the other part of this right now is, you know, you could potentially bring this back to a one stock deficit for your team here with some optimal play, but that's going to be so difficult to do against a character like Joker who just has a comeback mechanic or a stop bleeding mechanic built in. Yeah, what's also really annoying about this matchup for Ness is that uh, Joker is really good at the offstage play just because of those guns that he can like uh, fire like downwards. Ness is a character who uh, infamously struggles getting back on stage, uh, and if if Prince is really crafty and uh, like really good at aiming at those bullets, he's gonna make it tough for uh, Coco Master to ever do anything to get back on. Yeah, and I mean, the other the other difficult thing about it, too, I think, a lot of times for Ness is, I've always considered Ness a character who can really mix up the way he hits you when you're in a defensive spot, when you're a little bit stationary, never knowing exactly how he's going to mix up the way that he follows up. Joker ain't standing still. Yeah. <laughs> the elephant, I mean, you see him hopping around right there already. Uh, good fair, though, to protect himself right there. I think fair is an option that best players, like, uh, need to be, like, shameless about, like, spamming. Oh Ooh. my god, and the PK fire and the F smash, and that's going to be the stock going over from Prince. Coco Master looking very good, but a lot of damage packed on him right now, so he has to be very careful. Yeah, needs to take this stock for basically nothing on his enemy. Wants to at least bring them back to a respectable spot here in the match. 41 damage at the start, not too bad. Ooh. Forced, oh, you know, we said how many times are you going to have to get through? Yeah. And Apparently I really one more like, time than that. So, in Prince right there, it demonstrated that he was, in fact, paying very close attention to how uh, how many times Coco Master used PK Fire in the last 30 seconds because he said, all right, well, I'm just going to use my down B and we'll see if, uh, if it bounces back in Ness's face. And surely it did, and that ended up um, causing costing Coco Master his final stock. And, of course, there, no change here in the deficit. Uh, a very, very valiant attempt by Coco Master, especially yeah. with that explosive take on the first stock, but... We, we did say it at the start. You're going to have to get through a lot of Arsene in order to bring this back to an even match between the two teams. And the second time Arsene came out was all it took. And I don't, I don't really blame Coco Master for going for the, the PK fire right there. Uh, <laughs> that's funny. My camera's frozen. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there must be something <laughs> odd with my camera, but that's a really, really no, just cool leave face it there. I'm making. It's man. so snowy. Uh, I love it. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I don't blame Coco Master for going for the PK Fire right there, um, just because like it had been working really well up to that point. Uh, I think that moment was more of an outplay by Prince, just like adapting to what was going on. And like on paper, that felt like a good moment for him to PK Fire because he could have definitely gotten a lot more off of it. Um, but it's unfortunate that the, uh, the mix up went through there. See, oh, I know that cool. uh, it shouldn't be too long here until we get our next. So we've got a wolf coming out here. Wolf V. Joker here. See it right there. Mid to 23. 23 stocks taken. 20 stocks lost here. But Wolf versus Joker. We're still at a two okay. stock deficit here. Are the members of Francis Howell. So still a little bit of a uh, time to bring back. But excited to see here now. Wolf, man, such an interesting character. I feel like so often when you talk about Smash Ultimate, you can't tell the story of the early parts of it without Wolf. And yeah. it's it just such a such an intriguing character, I think, in the history of this game. Yeah, definitely. And I think, like you mentioned, he was very um, crucial during like the early part of the game. But because of that, I think people often forget that Wolf is still good. Uh, I think he tends to get left out of like top 10, top 15 conversations. Obviously, I'm not here to, to discuss where exactly on the tier list he is because <laughs> nobody really knows. And that's always so uh, hotly debated, but he's good. The, the thing you need to know is that Wolf is good. <laughs>
Joker, however, is also good. So um, I think this will be <laughs> another a, character you yeah. can't talk about this game's history without talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think Joker was okay. I guess not counting Quentin, Joker was the first DLC. Um, so like he was the first official DLC. So um, yep, definitely a character that's been around here uh, since the start. Um, all right, I think it's when I okay. I see. I figured it out now. It's when I tap away from OBS is when my camera gets frozen like that. So uh, I guess I'll just keep it keep it on that screen. Uh, but anyway, yeah. So Joker versus um, Wolf should be pretty solid. I think um, I don't really know necessarily who wins that matchup, uh, but I think there's going to be a lot of uh, projectile throwing out there, uh, a lot of wolf lasers. I mean, it, I guess it depends on the type of playstyle the wolf player has. Some wolves don't use it that much. It's always one of those kind of things where as soon as you start a match against a wolf and you see the laser come out, you go, yep, okay, he's one of those kind of wolf players. <laughs> um, so, so we'll see. Uh, we'll, we'll see what we'll see what this uh, what this player pulls out. Um, also, I was mentioning the uh, the advantage that. Oh wow, the camera looks really cool now. That's an interesting uh, special effect. <laughs> um, yeah, the. Uh, the the thing that Joker can pull off against Ness, where he just like shoots laser or shoots like bullets down him to mess with his recovery, the same thing can happen to Wolf. And I, one could say that Wolf might have an even more abusive recovery than Ness because it's like much more linear. Um, so it'll be it'll be interesting to see if uh, if the Joker makes good use of that in that matchup. Yeah, we'll have to see. I'm looking down the rosters here as well, just kind of looking, trying to look a little bit ahead of the future. I know that uh, Francis Howell North does have a uh, their Ganon player still sitting on there, uh, sitting a little bit further back. Uh, they still have Yoshi Kid, who by all accounts, I believe, is their, is their top player. So probably saving that for the anchor. Meanwhile, of course, the CBC Cadets still have Luma, their Rob player. They still have the letter H, who's their hero player, and they still have Time Master. So Still uh, a lot of discussion yet to be had about who they'll send in next, when they'll send in one of these players. But uh, for now, uh, you know, it'll be nice to look at a matchup that I think a lot of people who follow this game competitively will uh, yeah. be at least somewhat familiar with. Yeah. It, it, what's also funny is uh, I'm very curious to know what the um, like control, like controller name setup is that that team has going on because I've noticed like the last three players have had Yoshi Kid as their tag in the game. So like, I don't know, maybe they just all use Yoshi Kid's controls. Um, not entirely sure, but I would hate to, I would hate to see that. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's likely a situation where they're either all at like one switch or, or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, that would certainly keep the connection more consistent as well. So either that or they all just really like Yoshi Kid. And I don't think yeah. either of those is a, <laughs> is a bad answer, so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely, uh, definitely the case there. Uh, so yeah, uh, I think they are still getting their getting their players already. I think they might be having some tech difficulties they're still figuring out. Um, yeah, yeah, tech issues. So yeah, it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see which player comes out uh, explosively there. Who? What's the stock count again? It's uh, uh, I think Joker only lost one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's nine to eleven here. So okay. it's it's still a, it's been a two stock deficit ever since the first time the players have just traded essentially whatever the stocks were since that first match. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So yeah, it's still very close right now, but of course we do have that uh, looming threat, no pun intended, of Luma, who still has yet to <laughs> take to the field and, uh, and really make a difference here. And that, to kind of bring it back to the strategies we were talking about earlier, with like different ways to to order your players, best players, blah, blah, blah. It sounds like they're kind of treating Luma as a, a, a last pick. Is he the last pick, actually? Well, but, we yeah. don't know yet. They're probably, they. I believe they still get to decide that later on. But, oh, okay. I mean, with the way that, that Kai played in the lead that they got, it, it's one of those situations where you have, I guess, the privilege, for lack of a better term, of just saving your biggest weapon until the very end, saying, okay, if all goes horribly wrong, we end it right here. And at yeah. any point, they can send Luma in. And I think... You know, on the other side of things for uh, Hell North, I wonder at what point you send in Yoshi Kid, where you just say, okay, we have to make this deficit up. Maybe we catch lightning in a bottle and you're able to outplay Luma in a stock deficit. Because, I mean, crazier things have happened here. Yoshi, of course, a character that can do a little bit of everything, certainly has the tools to win almost any matchup. Uh, but we can talk about that later, because right now we have a current matchup in front of us. It is going to be Prince on the Joker. Getting sets here versus mid to 22 23 on the wolf and on FD, no less. 
All right, so, yep, Prince again with a little bit of a stock deficit just because of the format, the way crew battles play out. Uh, but with the advantages we mentioned earlier with uh, what Joker can do to Wolf, it should be pretty easy for him to bring it back. Ooh, that down B catches nothing right there, but it doesn't matter because Prince able to tack on some damage anyway. Good catch. Anytime okay. I see an air dodge into the screen that early on in a match, I get a little bit nervous. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, it, just like we just saw in, in this previous, Prince's previous game, he did really love in that down B, and the, the sooner that uh, Midget's able to catch on to that, he's going to be able to get some hard punishes. Like, if he was a little closer there, that would have been nasty to punch. The yeah, F-Smash as well is another thing Prince really seems to like. Uh, okay, both these players love those F-Smashes. <laughs> Well, I think, what are you thinking when you're in this situation? Oh. On one side, you're thinking, throw an F-Smash out and get an early stock, bring my team back. And on the other side, you're saying, maybe cheese a stock here, maybe steal one mm -hmm. in a situation where I wouldn't have been able to get it early. I feel like hard reads in this format, players naturally gravitate towards. Whether or not it's a good option or not, I feel like uh -huh. that's just something that's always lingering in their mind is, one stock can make such a big difference here. And actually, this is starting to look dominant the other way. Yeah. And I think well, what you've been midget, uh one thing he's been doing really well so far is like catching landings. We saw him actually steal a stock by catching a landing on the F smash, uh, but he was also able to get a grab. He got a few things uh, earlier on too. So uh, Prince really gonna have to be uh, like mix it up a little bit with how he gets back to the ground. Yeah, and this is where Wolf's falling Nair starts to be especially scary right there. You saw as soon as Prince landed, immediately set in shield, knowing that there are so many things the Wolf wants to follow up with there. Free grab as a result. Now needs to find a way to clean this up. How deep is he going to go off? Oh my goodness, no! that's a spike right there. Midget having not lost a single stock, let's take that one quite comfortably. You're good. Well, not hey, bad. we said they need to pull catch lightning in a bottle to pull this one back. How about that? That was not long at all. We got an even game, 3-3. Three, three. Yeah, that is uh, really great work uh, by Midget right there. Um, and I think... Uh, Prince was just getting a little bit too predictable with a lot of stuff he was doing uh, and, and his like defensive maneuvers. You saw right there that Midget was able to get a grab. I, I think Midget did a really good job at like mixing up the way he decided to go in and capitalize on a, on a bad situation, a bad placement by Prince. He got a lot of grabs because of that. That right there, yeah, that was unfortunate. I think Prince was not quite sure which kind of recovery Midget was going to go for. Um, and because of that, he put himself a little bit too, uh, too close in harm's way and Midget was able to take that stock. Yeah, that's always such a scary situation where they're right in the spot where both of their recovery options can work. And you say, do I go off? And then you get caught in between the two. And usually you don't get punished quite that hard for it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that's you talked about it before, how easy it is, or I guess rather how many options Joker has to punish that recovery. But there is a level of decisiveness that you have to have for any of those options to work. And in the heat of the moment, it's a fast paced game. You're both over 100 percent. It happens sometimes. And I think it helps that um, uh, that Midget didn't really go for that option too much when getting back on stage because the Wolf side B is one of those things where the more you do it, okay, it's kind of like if a Ganon starts the match by jumping off the ledge and then side being back on to the stage, <laughs> you're like, okay, that's a thing, I need to watch out for that. If the fact that Midget didn't really use it that much kind of um, made it hard for Prince to remember that as a thing to watch out for. And that's kind of why we saw him get spiked. He was like, all right, let me place myself for this like edge guarding right here. And then, boom, Sybe came through and didn't, uh, didn't quite look good for him there. So we will be seeing the next players uh, set up soon. Uh, it's going to be... Um, okay, looks like Time Master is coming out next. I've seen him in the uh, Discord a little bit. Didn't know he was going to be one of the players today. It's a Tyra and Dr. Mario player. Yeah, and it actually is the Dr. Mario that's been locked Ooh, in. So okay. we're going to see a little Dr. Mario Wolf here for you all. Still waiting a minute to see what the stage is going to be. But right there, 11 stocks won, 10 stocks lost. So um, I, you, you know we're down to three players now. And again, just to kind of let you all know if you're just joining us, this is a five versus five crew battle here. Every player has three stocks. The team is a total. 15 stocks and we are tied at nine stocks apiece. So we wanted a close championship and so far it's been back and forth. Yep, it's like we've essentially reset to a three person crew battle only. Uh, <laughs> nice nice to see the, the numbers stay close like that. I mean, it'd be really cool if we can get down to like three stocks to three stocks, like that would just be the most exciting outcome. Uh, it's a championship, so obviously the, the stakes are high either way. Um, so. We'll see who's able to perform best under pressure here. Dr. Mario is, that's a, he's a very interesting character. I don't, 
I've learned to respect Dr. Mario very early on because we have Tim Prater in St. Louis, who's sure. a very talented Dr. Mario player. Um, he's he's very similar to Little Mac in my mind in that like he's kind of indisputably a bad character, but he has some really really strong tools that can dramatically make a big difference if the player is better than the other player. Uh, like you can play against a good Dr. Mario or a good Little Mac and think there's no way this character's bottom tier, uh, <laughs> whereas like. Whereas certain other like bad characters, they don't really work that way. Like someone like Kirby, you lose to a Kirby and you're like, okay, Kirby still sucks. That player was just really good. <laughs> Dr. Mario and Little Mac are just like, oh my God, they're <laughs> those characters are nuts. Well, I, and to that point, I think any character that has the Mario archetype, you know, like if he catches me, I'm going to take it on the chin. Like I'm going to take some damage here. If he catches me, he's going to have some options to, to box his way out of bad situations. Mm -hmm. Like. There's always something there. It just never quite adds up to beyond the sum of its parts, but it's still the sum of its parts. And, you know, I, I would say this should be an interesting one to really decide the momentum of it because I would argue the same for Wolf. You know, Wolf does everything pretty well. And I would mm -hmm. say that Dr. Mario, if you're looking at him as a character, is everything kind of well. So mm -hmm. we'll see here. Uh, this is a, a big moment in the crew battle. If this is a dominant victory for either side, it's going to be so difficult to re-grab it. Yep, yeah, that's a good call. This is a good moment for either of them to really uh, break ahead and lead and, and set the pace for the, the second half of the crew battle. Okay, how are the combos? Okay, I'm kind of able to get a little bit off that. Uh, like you mentioned, Dr. Mario with that Mario archetype, as soon as he hits you, he can probably get a lot more hits in there, so we'll see just how often I'm actually able to convert off these strings. And also two characters that are going to try to come down with hitboxes a lot of times, and even if they don't hit you necessarily, if you choose a defensive option, really tooled well to punish that, and a lot of times these matchups become a battle of identifying what your opponent's doing in those situations. And this is a ton of down B here from the Dr. Yeah. Mario. I love it here. Yeah, it's it, it seems like it's it's one of those things where if he just happens to catch Midget uh, trying to navigate to a different part of the stage and he gets him with either part of that tornado, it's most likely going to be killed. So. Uh, showing him that he will use the cape to reflect those lasers, but it just doesn't care. He's going to keep doing it anyway. And I think this is one of the first times in this entire crew battle where I've seen a player just say, wait a minute, I can do this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me just run back and use my projectile here. And the F smash again, catching him there. We said this entire time the down be used to catch when Midget's navigating down. That time, catching mm -hmm. navigating down with the tornado. Well, and another thing Midget's doing here is he, he's like seamlessly like switching between two different playstyles. We do see him running away and throwing lasers a lot. But then he, every once in a while, decides, let me get close enough to you that you think you're safe, then I'm going to go for another laser. Ooh, that time he gets too close and suffers to a up smash. Only fitting that they would immediately again be right at around the same percentile again, <laughs> just mm. refusing to let the other one get too far ahead. Yeah, and I think um, Time Master is also starting to pay attention to what Midget's likely uh, first moves are in neutral. It, it seems like Midget likes to run in and then jump. Oh my god, and there goes the kill coming through from I think that was the down B, right? The it was, was again. Was. And, and that time, that whole thing was started because he threw out the down B and then immediately got a back air out. Midget had jumped in to try to punish the aerial down B. So at yeah. that time, he was a little scared of it, and now he might not try to punish it as hard as he was before. So nice little bit of mental battle going back and forth. Yeah, Time Master able to take a pretty solid lead right there. And what I was going to mention before the, the kill went through is that I think Time Master is noticing that a neutral midget likes to just run forward and then jump. And I think he's noticing that Mario, Dr. Mario has some aerial options that can beat out uh, both of the air, whether it's uh, the back air or like a, a neutral air. Yeah, and I think that's part of the other reason we've seen so much down B2 <laughs> is... Okay, let, aside being a down like B, that. you love to do, but yeah. I think that's another reason why you're seeing so much down B is I think he's noticing, okay, if he's going to continually run forward and double jump, and then, you know, the classic short hop into double jump immediately if you don't feel like you have a good thing there, down B is tailor-made to get around that. Yeah, and Midget kind of showing his hand a little bit too early there. We saw that side B on stage, which is normally not often used, but you can tell he wants to get something really big off it. Uh, yeah, that's not going to kill. Wolf does not have kill throws. Ooh. Yeah, Midget uh, having multiple opportunities to punish uh, air dodges by Dr. Mario there, but just not fast enough on the draw to, uh, to punish him. And he really needs to clean this up here. One stock deficit can be brought back, but oh, that was there funny. we go. Oh. Okay. Yeah, just having anticipated exactly where Time Master is going to be at that moment. Can Midget make the, the comeback happen here? 
Oh, just barely six away from that. Another one. Oh no, we're having Roland F smash now. It's that part of the stock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Time Master started to get really desperate for this kill. He he knows that the comeback is very possible right now, so uh, he doesn't want to slip through his fingers. And like, I don't blame, I was gonna say Time Master can get a lot more aggressive off stage, but I mean, he's Dr. Mario, so I don't blame him for being nervous about that. And he just saw his teammate Prince get spiked from trying to go off stage, just barely against Wolf, so uh, he's gotta be very careful. Right, and maybe not scared. Now maybe needs to be a touch scared here. Not, it's gonna take a couple more hits here, probably another 20%, unless it's a huge hit right next Ooh. to the side. Big damage, okay. Oh, oh. Was yep, he was expecting the air dodge in right there, and now all of that hard work Midget went into all, or mid Midget put into almost bringing it back, completely undone by Time Master. Uh, really pulling the wind out of the sails. And you talk about the Mario archetype here, the Mario Brothers archetype. What is more Mario Brothers than running away when your opponent jumps at you and throwing out an up smash? I love it. Especially yeah, if, you think that if you've been getting caught by a lot of these falling neutral airs and things of that nature that Wolves love to do, that's just such a fantastic option, especially when a trade nets you the win of the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just before uh, Midget ended up losing his last stock there, we saw a really good like uh, down air that uh, got made Mario, Dr. Mario bounce off the stage. And I think he was expecting an air dodge in, which is why he charged the F smash like that. But if he had just waited a little bit, he could have gotten like a solid F smash. Maybe he could have charged it a little, and then he would have gotten the kill. Uh, it's just one of those moments where you think, you, you force yourself to anticipate what the opponent's going to do when you actually had time to just wait and see what they were going to do, and then yeah. Uh, that, that's such a, that, that's such a great point too, because that's I think like one of the next steps that these you know young players are going to take as they get better at the game is realizing there are so many moments where, like you said, you had time to wait for the correct option to show itself to you. Because yep. I, I think there's a lot of merit in like, okay, I need the stock. One option gets me the stock. I'm going to do it whether or not it hits. Because yeah. the risk is, you know, big. But the reward is I win the game. So I understand those situations. But I think a lot of times it's recognizing when those situations have to happen and when you can wait for them to show themselves. So I think that's a fantastic point by you. Yeah, and you need to have like patience for it too, because like you mentioned, in those like high pressure situations, how often is someone going to have the like nerves of steel to just stop and not press any button? Uh, but the better you get at the game, the the more like like the higher your ability will be to do those kind of things. Um, mm -hmm. And especially, I think it's even more effective when it's a player who um, plays very aggressive or like naturally presses a lot of buttons. Because when you just sit still, your opponent would be like, they're definitely gonna press something right here, right? So I need to like to air dodge. <laughs> but in that situation, no, but they didn't because they turned down the pressure a little bit. Uh, but maybe that will be something Midget will uh, learn to incorporate into his, his play style a lot more moving forward. But Time Master gonna get uh, some more opportunities to show us what this Dr. Mario can do um, as he faces off against the next opponent on that side, who's going to be a lucky, ooh, a Ganon uh, player. I was foreshadowing this when I mentioned Ganon earlier. <laughs> All right, well, there you see it. 20 stocks won, 13 stocks lost here. Ganon, an absolute tank of a character here, which does mean that the only player they have left is their is their captain, uh, Yoshi Kid, sitting at the top there. So it is going to be saving the best for last. But, you know, we haven't really gotten to talk about this because we haven't had a true heavy that's been in this crew battle. Heavies in crew battles are such an interesting dynamic because they are grinded out type of characters. And it almost feels like sometimes the opponent gets another stock because of how much damage the character can take. Yeah, especially like, it's almost one of those moments where imagine you're playing like a, you're doing a boss battle in an RPG, you, you get the boss really close to dead, but then they just heal themselves right back up. That's essentially what, yeah, what heavy and crew battles work like, where if you don't take off that last stock and they win that match of the crew battle, boom, they're just healed back to full health at the end of the next one, you gotta do the whole thing over again. Oh right. man. One stock to bring it back to even, and already approaching with a little invulnerability. It's okay, we like to see it. And already two dash attacks, 30 damage. Sure, Ganon, why not? Yeah, and the scary thing uh, for Dr. Mario in this matchup is just how close he needs to get. And Ganon, like, Ganon wants him to get close, just so he can, like, jab him out or something, or go for, like, a side B. Like, usually the way you beat Ganon is by camping him out or, like, outranging him, but uh, Dr. Mario not gonna be able to do either of those. Yeah, and I think really important now here that Lucky, as he kind of goes through here, that he is the patient player because, uh, again, I think that the time that Ganon really, really gets scary here is throwing out moves that aren't necessary in order to try to close in, get grabbed, get a lot of damage put on you there. 
No, 94%, 64%, still relatively close given how heavy Ganon is and how hard he can hit. Mm -hmm. um, and you see that he's kind of trying to get into this middle zone here where he has a chance to move through the pill, and that's exactly right there what he had been looking for. Trying to get past the pill with the dash attack to knock Dr. Mario up for a follow-up, but maybe misjudged the placement just a little bit of that dash attack. Oh, there he goes right there. See, not afraid to go off stage against the Ganon, uh, knowing he didn't have to be as careful as he did against the Wolf earlier. He goes off deep and he gets a huge capitalization off the Ganondorf. It's hilarious. He's the edge guard, but a forward air going to come through right there for Lucky and win that game for him. And it's so huge that Time Master was able to take that. That's a 1-1 between these two players, but getting the stock lead back in that situation especially when i mean you saw there that was a ganon at zero that was able to take him with a forward air at the edge there that could have happened at any point in the game so to close it out here with this beautiful down b just uh, very clutch it may not go down in the stat book as anything huge but that does wonders for taking the momentum back for your team yep definitely um and unfortunately uh that is the last of the uh dr mario that we'll be seeing but uh, we will be seeing another player come out next. I think it's the, yep, the hero player next. The letter H uh, is his name. So uh, we're gonna get some, we're gonna get some randomness going on here. It's kind of funny Aww. playing against a character, uh, playing against a player whose name is Lucky. We'll see how Lucky, Lucky's opponent. Wow! Wow! His, uh, you couldn't have drawn it up any better than that. <laughs> exactly. So uh, uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what kind of hero shenanigans we get. I will say that Hero is one of the characters who, like, when I'm playing online. As soon as I run into Hero, I get such a mix of like, oh god, not this guy, plus I can't wait to beat this guy. <laughs> because I just, I can't stand the character, and it, it's just one of those things, he makes me roll my eyes more than any other character except maybe Snake. Um, so, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see if, uh, if the letter H can uh, employ an obnoxious playstyle and really get some crazy stuff going here. Yeah, and we joked a lot in the in the pregame and really throughout the broadcast about hero and crew battles, hero and crew battles. What madness can this character do? And you brought up the point of in a normal game, it's three stocks, three stocks. Whatever like crazy thing happens, it's in that game, right? It's done. We move on to game two. We're there. Everything that happens here because you're playing with only 15 stocks and that's it. It magnifies every single time. So any crazy hero shenanigans here will just be that much bigger and. Again, they still have their best player, arguably the best player in this entire crew battle, waiting here. So Lima's just wait and say, "Yeah, go ahead and give me, give me a hatchet man, a hatchet man stock take at like zero yeah. percent. Just make my make my job a little bit easier, so I don't have to work too hard." And Hero certainly has the tools to do it. Yeah, and the interesting thing about playing against Hero is, I, I feel like his the the popular counterplay to him has changed a little bit over time, and obviously it changes depending on what your uh, what character you're playing as. But sometimes you want to say okay, apply pressure on him when he has the menu open because he's not looking at you, he's looking at his menu. So that's when you jump on him. But so many times playing against Hero, you have these moments where you're like, let me run into him. And then he gets Kamikaze or something, or he gets something that like, you shouldn't be that close in his face. So it's, it's really hard. Like you have to be just as fast as reading his menu as the player himself is. So it can be a tough thing to do. Three, two, one, that it can. So we're gonna see Ganon head on out. Stock is gone. And he's back. And wait it out, and we're off. Very, very nice there. Letter H not menuing a little bit early to uh, yeah. <laughs> try to steal some back. I respect I was sports and chips. I was thinking about that. I was like, he could menu, he could charge his neutral B, or like whatever the fireball thing is. Uh, but he do this. You got a good, like you said, a good sports and chips. Uh, so both players really kind of trying to feel each other out, but uh, Letter H. Was already going for some really strong options and able to give himself time to charge up that fireball as well. Yeah, and that's the really rough part too. We were talking about all this related to Hero. Ganon doesn't exactly have a ton of ways to like go in and punish menuing even there. I mean, you're going to come yeah. in with dash attacks, down Bs, maybe a side B, or Ooh. a drifting forward air, and that would have certainly taken the stock, but uh, very nice timing on the air dodge here. Yeah, that's a little Fortune. scary. Oh. Fortunately, the letter H was able to get away with that air dodge. Normally, air dodging onto stage against a Ganon is not what you want to do, especially when they can just keep charging that. Oh, he's gonna die for that for sure. Yep. That's Even if it didn't, that... yeah. <laughs> Even if it didn't send him to the blast zone, he would have had a hard time making it back. Uh, so, letter H getting that stock right there. Let's see if he can get back on. Lucky, but if he can uh, the edge guard, he's not gonna get that. Time. Oh my goodness, very solid. Yeah, the classic jump, double jump into your strong aerial. Tail yeah. is all this time. And G Ganon's forward air actually has like deceptive range and that's so much damage already and he's, he's probably not going to get back. Ooh. Oh, and accelerate too. 
Yep. Okay, so Lucky really gonna have to face this out here. Um, you just actually you just needs to find a way back on. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Letter H looking like speed shop right there, just chases him off stage and steals the box. His double jump was gone so early in that sequence that I'm not sure there was anything that could have been done there. It's it's easy to look at that and say, why did you air dodge? It's Ganon. That was the only thing that was left. And yeah. you, know, you can see the brutal replay here of just how just how much damage was already on. But you can see right there, the double jump was gone. He mm -hmm. was able to land. So it happened a little bit later. You saw, there it is. That's where the double jump left. And look at this, accelerate, still not landed. Off stage, using it earlier. And it just, again, there's nothing Ganon can do. He has to yeah. get momentum going back to the stage, but in doing so, accelerate just too much. Yeah, I, Accelerate really was the key there because it gave um, Letter H the tools he needed to like chase him across the stage like that. And like, another thing was that uh, one thing that made that moment really scary for uh, Lucky as well is you mentioned how his jump got taken away at one point. He was doing a lot of things that kind of made it easy for Hero to do that to him. He even, uh, there was a point where he was standing on the Pokemon Stadium platform on stage and he like jumped and then immediately jumped again. Not entirely sure why he did that, but that's one of those moments where you look back uh, like on a replay or something and you're like, yep, that right there was very dangerous because if I would have got hit off stage, I would have lost my stock even sooner. Um, so that's one of those things that just preserving your jumps is something that a player needs to learn how to do as they get better at the game. Uh, and even I myself struggle with it. I When I get sent off stage, for some reason, I always blow my double jump immediately. Um, and especially as playing mess, that, that's a really bad thing to do. Uh, so in moments like that, you just have to be patient, jump once, or don't jump at all. Um, and be really careful with how you, how you use those resources. Yeah, well, I think to that note as well, especially when you're playing a heavier character that doesn't have as high of a jump, you get so used to your cadence of dump or jump, double jump, throw your aerial and fall for like the perfect spacing and the perfect timing of your aerial to land as slow as like as low as it possibly can. And I think that those like cadences and muscle memories are what you really fall into. But here we are, everybody, the final member, the anchor of the team here for Howell North. It is going to be Yoshi Kid and uh, some work to do and a mountain to climb here. But if there's anybody on this roster that can do it, it's going to have to be this pink Yoshi. Yep, that's right. Uh, has a lot of work to do. I mean, he still has Luma waiting for him. He's able to take these two stocks. Um, the name of the game for Yoshi Kid is going to be not dying. In fact, even though he's the one who's behind, I, I feel like he's going to do better to just like chill, like to just play really passively and take as little damage as possible and wait for uh, wait for Letter H to be the one to make mistakes. Yeah, but you know everything that we talked about with Ganon really having to get up close and personal, I think happens here as well. And Hero's just got all sorts of tools to ward Yoshi off. Or you know, Hero has a lot of I think really like momentum changing moves where you get in the cadence of their DI goes one way, I got knocked this way, and then he just has a move that says, "Nope." Turns out there's a projectile right there, and mm -hmm. that can be so difficult and infuriating to deal with because you've just gotten so used to the flow, you're trying to think of what's going to happen next, and Ooh, then it's a move that goes the other way and gonna run him all the way over here what's he gonna uh, get I mean, probably heal? just f smash him right there yeah, <laughs> Wait, yeah. Did, he heal? did he heal before that or what did he do <laughs> he, did. he was looking for something i'm not sure that a normal just that wasn't great di too it needs to be said yeah. but i think beyond that looking for something that probably would have gotten it for certain and i don't think that was a crit either so yeah i mean yeah, that's, that's just cool. that's the so fun, series huh? of unfortunate events there for yoshi kid yeah, and I think what's what's really unfortunate as well for Yoshi Kid is that Hero is the character that he's gonna have to play against. Like Yoshi deals with uh, struggles with swords pretty badly. Um, if this was like a Akamari or like something like a more of a brawler for Yoshi deal with, never mind. That spike comes through right there. That's exactly what he needed to really change this momentum. And now Letter H is probably feeling like uh, he might have to hand it off. Maybe so. It does have a nice full meter, so still plenty of shenanigans to have to deal with. The stocks are even, and now coming back the other way, Yoshi Kid not happy that a broken shield is what's going to determine the stock here. Yeah. <laughs> Aiming to prove that that was just some hero business going on. I'm trying to close this one out. Accelerate again, the old reliable. Yeah, really good for uh, allowing Letter H to get his stage control back. Uh, but he wants to see if he can at least take one more stock off before he hands things off to his buddy Luma. Um, oh, that F smash. Not quite on the mark. Oh, I whack, if he had jumped into that. No. Yeah. <laughs> so sad. Okay, yeah, so Letter H's, uh, his, his speed is a little bit low on these uh, menu openings here. Yoshi Kid not able to anticipate where he was going to land. Uh, but what I was going to say is that he's, oh, L smash comes through. And, Ooh, and he had just gotten psyched too. He had just yeah. gotten psyched up, so 
great job there to Yoshi Kid. Really showing the the chops that come. I know you mentioned that Yoshi Kid uh, has played in in many a local, so you really mm -hmm. saw the the composure there as everything was going wrong. You got your shield broken. You lost the stock at sixty percent. And Hero could have done anything. You saw Metal Slash and Kaboom were there. There was a whack thrown out. Your opponent gets Zoom in the bottom left of the stage and then Psych up. But it turns out your up smash still works. So why yeah. do anything different? And I think, and like, I, I think that what I was going to mention first is that like Letter H spends a little too much time in uh, in his menu. Um, it gave Yoshi Kid a lot of like opportunities to uh, punish him. And obviously that's one thing that gets better with time. The, the more you play Hero, the quicker you'll be able to just skim those menu items and select what you want. But I, I think Yoshi Kid picked up on that and he was like, Yo, that man's reading that menu at a fifth grade level. I, I think I can hit him before he can pick something here. Uh, and, and it worked out for him in that situation. I mean, at the very end though, I think whether or not uh, Letter H opened the menu, like he's probably gonna die because he, what else could he, he could've just like landed, air dodge or something. If he would've air dodged away, he would've been fine, but doing that against Yoshi is a very, uh, very scary thing to attempt. So um, can't really fault him too much for that. But as people in the chat are pointing out, it is time for Luma to come on out. It uh, is. <laughs> and there he is right there. And quite the uh, quite the character list he has as well. I do believe he will be gracing us with the, with the Rob today, though. Uh, yep, Rob is for sure coming out. I mean, just look at that stocks one to lost ratio. That's stunning. That is better than three to one. I mean, that's that means mm -hmm. that, I mean, if you're gonna lay that down in the simplest term, it takes at minimum two people to get through them. At minimum <laughs> two people. To hold this man down. <laughs> see what Yoshi could, oh, Yoshi, we can do this. So, one thing that, uh, so I've never seen these two play. I don't know how familiar they are with the matchup, but I think one thing that's going to be very important is that um, Rob is a big body. He has trouble landing and Yoshi can juggle for days. Um, I think Yoshi, if he can uh, keep Rob in the air and don't give him time to get to the ground and like set up his projectile, set up his, his balling, Yoshi kid could be set. Um, obviously that's easier said than done. There's an uphill sure. battle that he's gonna have to play here, but we'll see if he can pull it off. Everybody, we are here at the very end, and it is the two best players for each team. You couldn't draw it up any better than this. Maybe Yoshi Kid having all three stocks, but you know, we can't be choosers in this situation. A one stock deficit. Can Yoshi Kid pull off the upset and bring it back? All right, and already some fast movement coming through from Luma right here. That's one thing I'm already noticing that sets him apart from some of the other players. This man is just constantly jumping around the stage. All right, good string started up here for Yoshi Kid. Unfortunately, not able to get much else. Yeah, not too bad. And it, it's so interesting at the very start there, Yoshi Kid did an air dodge into the platform that I think if you look at in a vacuum, you would say, why are you doing that? But there's also no way that Luma was going to be ready for that either. So that's just one of these situations where it, it's what your opponent can react to with what they're anticipating. Nothing exists in a vacuum. Yeah, definitely. Oh, and yeah, Yoshi Kid, he just keeps getting these slivers of moments. Oh, his DI is going to have to be good here. Rob can really mix people up with where he sends you out of that up air. Oh. Yeah, that's definitely yep. a kill for sure. Um, yeah, we actually could staring down uh, the barrel of the gun here as Luma full two stock lead. And I don't think Luma is going to take this opportunity to, to get comfortable either. No. Nice little follow up there, standing right on the Pokeball for almost the entire duration of this game. Even doing a little dash dance on it too. Yeah. I don't think he's shot, willingly though. left that for something that wasn't to follow up this entire game. Right. <laughs> Uh, okay, Yoshi Kid has a little bit of opportunity here. He's gonna have to. Okay, he's gonna have to stuff out his landing a little bit harder there, making it all too easy for him to get back to the ground. But that pressure being applied from the down tilt, Yoshi Kid about to be off stage, but able to make his way back on. Would he have broken his shield if he just like didn't go through the platform there? I. It was close there. That's one of those situations where it depends on where Yoshi lands in relation to the other character, and that's really hard to tell in the moment. But to use that this. Like, that's, that's one of your, I have to get something yeah. going moves. And that is yeah. so frustrating when it doesn't work. Yeah, and Luma is being very calm. It's gonna be the back air that he jumps in with, able to space him out just perfectly. And Yoshi could, could not find the way back in. That back air range was insane. And Luma takes the final stock of the crew battle and gets the win for the cadets. As advertised. I would say if there's any two <laughs> yeah. words you can use for that. All the, all the commentary that we did there on that game Summarized is as advertised. Um, and, you know, we, we could talk about the matchup here, but you got the sense that at no point really ever in that game did Luma feel anything, you know, no no real pressure. You have the stock lead. You know the opponent's going to have to run into you. You have a little bit of rage built up there, and mm -hmm. it's, it's 
good players do good things. Yeah, definitely. And, and I will say that despite the, the behemoth uh, that Luma is on that team, I think uh, Howell actually did a really good job keeping it very close. Um, I, I want to give a quick shout out. Obviously, all the players did well, but I want to give a quick shout out to Midget, who I believe did a lot of work, that wolf player, mm -hmm. um, a lot of work in, in, in keeping things close and taking stocks, which the side D on the, on the Joker. A lot of, lot of really good highlight moments um, that, that was able to set the stage nicely for Yoshi Kid to come in and do some work as well. I think they only lost. Uh, actually, did Luma lose a stock there at the end? I don't think no, he did. No, no, Luma did uh, not lose a stock. Yeah, he got he got pretty close to losing a stock. I think uh, definitely can't say that that was a, a clear and obvious win for Luma in that situation. Um, I can see a world where where Yoshi Kid is able to uh, apply pressure really well and and make that uh, miracle comeback. But instead, it's going to be the Cadets taking the win and still some great Smash played by everyone all around. Yeah, and again, like you said there, congratulations to uh, CBC for getting that win, but also to, to all of the teams just for competing in this. This was, you know, this type of format, especially over a long period of time for high schools, I know is not an easy thing to pull. And um, it's just so cool to see to see uh, Missouri high schools getting involved with this sort of thing. Because mm -hmm. this, uh, this type of thing hasn't been around too long around these parts. So it's really encouraging to see that it's up. Yeah, definitely. Um, and also good to see uh, all the people in chat going nuts uh, watching their uh, watching their uh, favorite players duke it out. <laughs> all he's called, he's too good. He's the warlord of Smash. Uh, it says <laughs> Shadow X. I think we got a huge Aluma fan right there. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's that, that's one of my favorite things about um, about Smash, like coming out, coming back in like an offline capacity. Now the pandemic starting starting to die down a little bit, people getting back to the stuff, is people um, gathering to like cheer, cheer on everyone, both like in the chat rooms and in person. Like that's just such a cool thing to see at tournaments all the time. So excited to to get the, the audience vibes back. Yeah, it's all about the, the camaraderie. That's the thing when your your friends go play and now you can actually say your teammates are out there going and playing. That's uh, not something that's existed, I think, in a major capacity for esports really until the last you know, handful of years, and mm -hmm. especially not at the high school level. Like some colleges have picked it up. Of course, some of the bigger academies have it, but to get it at a high school level for a game that so many people have and so many people enjoy sharing with other people, um, I agree. That's the that's why we do it. That is why we do it indeed. Well, thank you all for joining us. It's been a pleasure to cast with you, Nine Whole Grains. Uh, hope you guys are looking forward to the next events that most of might be running. Keep. Keep uh, watching Twitter and keep paying attention to social media to see if anything gets announced. I'm sure, uh, sure we'll be seeing some more from these players very soon. Thank you all. Good night.